But the real law of attraction is really about resonance. You evolve yourself. And as you evolve yourself, whatever resonates with that new you comes to you. Hi, everyone. In this closing presentation in AFES, I, I want to share with you, initially I was thinking I was going to share with you how Mind Valley built a 2 million person email list. But then I thought, look, you guys will figure that out. There are tons of other people who talk about that sort of thing. Instead, I want to share with you something a little bit more personal. I want to share with you how there was a particular period recently where it felt like the entire universe was caving in on me. And almost three times in a row, over three years, I almost lost um, the entire business. I've never shared this story publicly, but it was a period of like incredible pain for me between 2013 and 2016. I think there's a value in sharing it here because it makes you understand that all of us are going to go through a lot of shit as we try to build our influence. But secondly, there were some interesting lessons I learned from this period. And I think there's a value in these lessons as well to help you overcome the hurdles. So I'd like to share this story instead. Are you guys cool with that? So we all know what Mind Valley does. We bring together the world's best minds. We, um, I'm really proud of the fact that we employ people from 54 different countries right now, that we put on this incredible festivals, that we work from one of the most beautiful office spaces in the world. But that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the breakdown. And the interesting thing is, this breakdown didn't happen in the early years of Mind Valley. It happened 10 years into running the company. And that is what I find most interesting about it. 10 years into being a CEO, I was fucking failing miserably. And I want to share what happened because it was so dramatic how disaster after disaster after disaster struck. I thought the universe was literally against me. So the story is I started Mind Valley in 2003 in that little apartment in New York City. So back then, I was teaching meditation in New York. And Funny story about that little apartment is this is Times Square 2003 before Disney moved into Times Square and you know and created all of the Disney Broadway shows. So this wasn't Disney Times Square, this was like Crack and Hooker's Times Square. <laughs> Literally, you would get propositioned walking home almost every single night by a lady on the streets. Before I moved into that apartment, I found out from the landlord that it was a Thai massage parlor which had been refurbished. And if you lived in Times Square in New York, you know what Thai massage parlor is code word for. So yes, Mind Valley did start in a whorehouse, former whorehouse. <laughs> now that is me in 2003 in that apartment. I like this photo because the table and the chair I'm in, I actually salvaged from the streets. My neighbors discarded it. Beautiful thing about New York, it's a very friendly society. Every year when the new IKEA catalog comes out, the wealthier citizens go and buy the latest IKEA furniture. The older IKEA furniture gets left out in the street for people like me to pick up and use. Both of those were furniture I literally found on the street. In fact, that table, I loved that table. I used to work on that table. You could see I barely could afford pants back then. But on that table, that table in the IKEA catalog is actually called the LAC table. It's funny. The Swedes at IKEA actually named a table for the mental state of LAC you need to work on that 1495 desk. <laughs> so that was 2003. Now fla flash forward, 2013, 10 years ahead, you would think that after a decade, I would have everything figured out, right? Now Mindvalley was, was doing decent back then in 2013. AFES was running, we had just done our first AFES in Thailand. But this is when, I'd say, the most difficult years of my life suddenly started popping into existence. So the first thing that happened is that just before Thanksgiving 2013, I found out that my accountant, who had been working with me for four and a half years, had been stealing from me for four years. And she was someone that I completely trusted. She had stolen about a quarter million dollars, and all of a sudden I found that my right-hand person had been cheating on me. For four, and a, for four years to the tune of a quarter million dollars. That was devastating. It violated my trust in so many things. But that wasn't the end of it. Just six months after that incident, that completely shattered my illusion of like how awesome I was as a CEO and I had everything under control. Mind Valley was working with several different authors, and um, our biggest client 
was, um, was I won't state the name, but it was responsible for about 20% of our business. It was a meditation company, and we were in partnership with them, and we were the official promoters, and they brought in a CEO. And that CEO knew that our partnership, which had lasted seven years, was done in a handshake, handshake agreement. And he saw the amount of revenue and sales we were bringing into them, and he thought, you know, I want the entire thing. So I got sued by this CEO. And it was a completely frivolous lawsuit, but what had happened was because I didn't have my shit in order, I hadn't actually signed a contract. So the CEO knew that I didn't have a contract. She knew it was an e a handshake agreement, and she decided to sue me in the court of Laredo, Texas. Now, Laredo, Texas is a Mexican border town between Texas and Mexico. It has the most corrupt court district in the world. And I knew that she had bribed the judges. I knew because her own family members had leaked that to me. I did not want to get into a frivolous lawsuit and have to travel to Laredo and you know, face these judges whom I knew were, were, were dishonest. And so I gave up a $5 million business. I literally signed it off. We had to lay off 12 employees in Argentina who ran that business. That was devastating. These employees had kids, and our entire Mine Valley Spanish operations, which relied on that business, disappeared, lost everything. Our Argentinian office had to be shut down. That was incident number two. Now, to get myself out of that shit, I decided to go to Burning Man with the guy who at that point was my best friend. Went to Burning Man, had a lot of incredible experiences together, really bonded as men, and we then, he then convinced me that he could help me with my web operations. And the way to do that was to, he was gonna take over my merchant account. And to do this, I made another stupid mistake because I trusted him so much because we had done so much drugs together at Burning Man. <laughs> I gave him access to my bank account. Six months later, he fled with $150,000. So now my best friend had betrayed me. This actually fucking hurt. I didn't care about the money. I had difficulty trusting male business partners for years after that. Um, and it was horrible. Now we come to December 2014. It's now been one year of total chaos, and I get a call on December 26, just after Christmas. I'm in Estonia, and the call is, hey, Vision, we can't make payroll. Can we, um, you know, what do we do? We can't afford to pay salaries. So I'm like, I'll sell my car. So now I'm looking at selling my Merce so that I could have some money come in so that I could actually pay my team. And I felt like I was a failure. I never told the team. To this day, most people in Valley never knew this happened. At the last minute, my executive team, they agreed to just not get paid that month so that everybody else could get paid. And God bless them, like in January, we certainly had a cash infusion. It was the start of the year, and we were able to like pull ourselves out. Again, I thought that was the end. But then in February, my COO, who is now running the company, I find out that he's stealing from us. He saw that the accountant from one year ago you know, she basically just got a slap on the wrist, white collar crime. So he thought, well, I want a piece of that. And before he gets caught, he's stolen away $100,000. Another huge freaking like, like bit of chaos. It gets worse. At this point, we are thinking, okay, we're going to move Mind Valley to a new email marketing platform. It was called um, Exact Target, incredible platform. Like we were ba basically back then, like the company was reliant mostly on email. We had close to a one million person list, and we moved everyone to Exact Target. And it took us months to make that transfer, right? But as we were making that transfer, Exact Target got acquired by a larger company whose name I'm not allowed to mention because I'm not about to mention them kindly, and I had to sign a contract. But you can figure it out. And they, as a larger company, and their salespeople basically lied to us. Um, we signed a, a, a very strict contract, and when they acquired Exact Target, they didn't get the pipes fitting well. So over the next one year, we couldn't understand why our revenue had plummeted. Turned out, 40% of our emails were not being delivered. So now, every month, we are losing $100,000, month after month after month. And we had to go through a whole painful process of one year, wondering why no one is buying from us, why our customers are not there. Turns out, 40% of our customers were not just not getting our emails. Only when we figured it out, we were able to recover. This was three years of like chaos, three years where I couldn't understand why I was struggling so much. In 2015, I actually gave up being a CEO. I'm like, 
I can't do this. So I stepped down and asked someone else to take over. It, it didn't save things. It, Mind Valley continued bleeding money. Now, I just want to do a quick check in, check in with you. How many of you here have had someone steal from you in the company? Good. I'm so glad I'm not alone. How many of you here have had a ma massive technological glitch that almost cost you a business? Thank you for not making me feel alone. And how many of you here have had difficulty mis making payroll for yourself or your team? This happens to all of us. And, you know, the funny thing is, it kind of makes us like cockroaches. I think if you want to be a good entrepreneur, you've got to be like a cockroach. You've got to be comfortable crawling through a lot of shit and not getting killed. <laughs> but there's a, so I call this the cockroach theory of entrepreneurship. But there's another thing that's really cool about this. And Google, Google illustrated this. Google did a study, and I found this in a page of a book called Exponential Organizations by Salim Ismail. And Google found that its best people were not Ivy League graduates, but rather people who had experienced a big loss in their lives and had emerged from it transformed. According to Google, deep personal loss has resulted in employees who are more humble and open to listening and learning. And I think this actually applies to all of us, not just the people we hire, but when we go through shit, something shifts within us. I believe that the universe is benevolent, and I believe that what we often see as pain or struggle is often the universe's way of waking us up to something that is our true potential or a path that we really need to go on. So let's come back to Michael Beckwith, because he was one of our speakers here at AFEST. One of the biggest ideas I learned from Beckwith is this concept called Kensho versus Satori. Kensho, says Michael Beckwith, is growth through pain. Satori, says Michael Beckwith, is growth through insight. So if you accept the mental model that you are a soul having a human experience, and that, to make it fun, the soul forgets that it is truly a soul and puts you in this playground called planet Earth, then every now and then, the soul might need to autocorrect you. And it's going to autocorrect you in one of two ways. Kensho is autocorrection through pain. You're not listening. You're stubborn. So the soul is like, okay, I'm going to smack you at the back of your head till you wake up. That is growth through pain. But there's also growth through insight. And insight is when you are listening. Insight is when you go through introspection. Insight is when you meditate. Insight is when you learn to listen to your heart or intuition. And insight is what you call a satori moment. It's growth through awakening. So I wrote about this idea in my book because it was so insightful. And I drew this little diagram to illustrate what Michael Beckwith said. Okay, you can see Kensho moments, growth through temporary pain. They cause your life to dip. And, and the dip is painful. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And then there's growth through Satori or growth through insight. So I found this idea fascinating. The question is, how can we overcome the dips? How can we actually listen to our soul so it doesn't have to kick us on our butt and instead allow us to grow through introspection, through insight, through awakenings, through eureka moments, through aha moments? That is the question I want to talk about, because this is a much more comfortable way of growth. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. It doesn't require someone to steal from you. It doesn't require business failure. It doesn't require exact target as an email marketing software to collapse on you. And it, it allows you to, to grow in a more peaceful way. Now, to understand how to develop these Satori moments, I realized that one of the best ways to avoid Kensho is to understand the culture scape. The culture scape is a word I coined in my book, and it means the tangled web of beliefs, rituals, ideas that permeate the world. The culture scape is designed for human beings to make sense of a complex world. It tells us how to act, what to do, how to live our lives. It tells us what value systems to have, and it comes from fathers, mothers, teachers, preachers, organized religion, the media, politicians. The funny thing, though, about the culture scape is that while there are rules which are useful, for example, look two ways before crossing the street, or do a background check on your accountant before you hire her, <laughs> it also comes with a lot of bullshit rules, or brules, as I refer to them. Bullshit rules are rules that we adopt to simplify our understanding of the world. But these are rules which are not necessarily true. Now, the question I want to pose for you is, what if, very often, 
The pain that we experience is our soul telling us that we are following a bullshit rule. And that was my insight. I think, I believe, the more you separate yourself from the culture scape, now the culture scape has its purposes, right? You don't want to walk into a conference hall naked because you're a rule breaker. <laughs> you were thinking about that, weren't you? <laughs> but, but there are rules in the culture scape that make no sense. For example, I recently dropped the title CEO because I found that that was a rule. But the problem with that rule is it required me to operate in a certain way that I felt was out of alignment, and it caused a rift between me and the people I lead that I felt was out of alignment. I decided to remove CEO from my title and just be founder. So, rules often hold us back. And one of the big things I've been exploring in my life over the last one year is how many rules can I drop? How many rules no longer make sense to me? And so, you know, I changed the way we ran Mind Valley. I'm shifting the way AFAS functions. Me and Christina had a conscious uncoupling. I'm trying to live life based on my own terms rather than what society says is an acceptable way. So, in 2016, during this moment of great stress, I received an important phone call, and it was from this man, Sri Kumar Rao. He's actually going to be one of our lecturers at Mind Valley University. But what's cool about Sri Kumar is that he is an MBA professor in America. He teaches at Cornell, a Kellogg Business School, at London Business School, but he brings in wisdom from the East into his teachings. So he called me up, he's like, Vishen, I notice you've been really, really, really under a lot of stress, right? How can I serve you? And I said, and I spill my heart out to him, I told him everything I was dealing with, and he said, wait, 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 I wanna read you a poem. And I'm like, Rao, I don't have time to listen to poetry, like, I'm fucking drowning here. And he goes, just listen to this poem. Okay, now I want you to listen to this poem. The beautiful thing about poetry is that great poetry is a really unique form of art. There's the scene from Bohemian Rhapsody where somebody asks Freddie Mercury, what do the lyrics of Bohemian Rhapsody mean? And he goes, it means anything the listener wants it to mean. That is the essence of poetry. What you're about to hear is a poem by Rumi, a 13th century Afghan refugee who was fleeing the Mongol invasion. And Rumi wrote some of the most profound works of poetry in the world. This is what Rao, Sri Kumar Rao, read to me over the phone that day. When I run after what I think I want, my days are a furnace of distress and anxiety. But if I sit in my own place of patience, what I need flows to me without any pain. From this, I understand that what I want also wants me, is looking for me and attracting me. There is a great secret in this, for anyone who can grasp it. Let's go back to the first verse. When I run after what I think I want, what is it that you think you want? Often, these are elements of the culture scape, elements of human society that have told you, you need to do this. You need the garage with two cars, the two kids. You need the title on your business card. You need the bank account with a hundred grand in cash. But if you sit in your own place of patience, what I need flows to me and without any pain, or in other words, without the Kensho moment that is growth through pain. Now, when you can learn to get in this state, there's a great secret for anyone who can grasp it. Now, I didn't understand what the hell this poem was about because I was in a different state of mind when Sri Kumar Rao read it to me. But I want you to just reflect on that poem. So if we could just dim the lights and play some roomy reflection meditation music. I like to give our AV boys a challenge because they are so good at what they do. So I want 13th century roomy Sufi reflection music now. <laughs> Meditate on that poem. Close your eyes. Remember, each of you might interpret this in a different way. As you do, I'm going to read it out to you one more time. When I run after what I think I want, my days are a furnace of distress and anxiety. If I sit in my own place of patience, what I need flows to me and without any pain. From this I understand that what I want also wants me, is looking for me and attracting me. There is a great secret in this for anyone who can grasp it.
and you may open your eyes. I didn't understand what this poem meant back then, but today I think I do. And again, as your awareness grows, you're going to see more and more and more things into the wisdom of Rumi or any other piece of inspirational poetry you read. What I understood then was that I was operating from the do-be mechanism. The culture scape says, do this to be this. Do the college degree to be that. Do the job promotion to be this. Do the work as the engineer or the doctor, even if it doesn't light you up, to be this. It's the do-be paradigm. What I realized is that you've got to flip it around. What Rumi was talking about when he said, sit in my own place of patience, is that what I want comes to me. And I understand that what I want wants me too. That is the be-do paradigm. You be and you do. What I believe Rumi was saying, and again, I can't get into the mind of a 13th century Afghan poet, so I only have to assume here. But my interpretation is that what Rumi was really saying is that what you really want wants you too. Because what you really want versus what you think you want, what you really want comes from the soul. And what you really want, because your soul is part of this larger universe, it wants you too. And so, don't tune in to the rules of the world that tell you who to be, or what to want, or what to do. Instead, be who you really are. Listen to that soul, and know that what the soul wants, the universe wants you to have. And this is when the magic happens. This was what really shifted my life. So how do you get there? Well, you go deep into identifying your values. I'm gonna teach you how to do that in a moment. So what happened was, I happened to get a good teacher. He was a guy by the name of Amir Ahmad. He was actually supposed to be at the Safest, but um, he couldn't come. He was supposed to fly in from the Oslo Freedom Forum um, along with uh, Adam Roa. Um, I was gonna bring in Amir to teach you this exercise to have you establish your values, but because Amir couldn't make it, I'm gonna run it with you. Now, I did this exercise with Amir at the tail end of 2016. And I understood that I had four values, like four things that really drove me. The first was very easy, transformation. I believe in personal growth. I believe that personal growth should be the number one thing. The second was envisioning. I like to create. So whether you're an artist or an engineer like me, envisioning means you see the world as a canvas. And you want to build, you want to create, you want to invent, you want to inspire. It's a beautiful value to have. The third value, though, is unity. Now, all of these fit together. You can be incredible with personal growth. You can be an incredible creator. But if you don't have the value of unity, you can be an asshole, right? We've seen politicians who are, who are incredible at envisioning ideas, but their ideas are about walls rather than compassion. And so you've got to have that value of unity as well. And there is a fourth value, and that fourth value is love. And I'll come to what that means. So what happened was, I decided to discard all of the things that I was told to do. And I decided to just operate from the core and live by these four values. Now the beautiful thing about the values I picked is they are fairly generic. How many of you here resonate with the value of transformation? That means you believe that personal growth is really powerful. Awesome. What about envisioning? You believe in creation. Great. What about unity? You see the world as a single unit as homo sapiens rather than nations or, mi or religions or mythologies, okay? And love. You believe in being kind and compassionate to everyone you meet. Great. But are we really living that? Because I thought I lived those values, but I was not. So what I want to share with you is how I shifted from doing to being. And being me meant that everything else in my life had to become secondary to these values. That is when you're really living your value. Now, this is what happened when I made that shift. The first thing that happened is between 2016 and 2019, the company that was stagnating and going through these ridiculous like dips all of a sudden started exploding, like 50% year on year. I couldn't even explain it. We just seemed blessed to get the right people, to get the right opportunities. And then the energy of the company changed. We started becoming, before that, Mind Valley would publish products because it felt that, you know, this is a good market fit. Now we publish products that we really care about. We do our own products. We are friends with our teachers. There was a picture taken at AFES one year ago. And, you know, what's really cool about it is that the people who come, the teachers who come to AFES, become part of a tribe. Jay Shetty, who was in that picture, said, you speak once on a Mind Valley stage, and you are friends with them for life. 
it was incredible how the whole nature of what we were doing shifted. But one of the most curious things is that my physical body shifted. I'm going to show you two pictures. One was an actual profile photo of me taken by the same photographers here, but taken at AFES 2016 in Greece. And the second picture was taken two years later. Okay? And the picture on the, the first picture is actually me. In the second picture, my body had completely changed. I had gone from maybe 22% body fat to 14% body fat. I had astigmatism in my left eye. My astigmatism disappeared. I couldn't understand, but my health was actually changing. Now I know why it was going on, and I'm going to show you, but when you practice these ideas, your physical appearance will change. Your physical body will change. You can reverse aging. And it was incredible. Not only did the outside world change, but the inner world did. Michael Beckwith mentioned something really interesting. I was interviewing him just before he got on stage. And he said, a lot of people misunderstand this concept called the law of attraction. They think it's about, you know, thinking the thoughts that you want, the love, the car, the money, and attracting that to you. He says, that's a kindergarten level of understanding. It's useful to some people, but the real law of attraction is really about resonance. You evolve yourself. And as you evolve yourself, whatever resonates with that new you comes to you. But ultimately, it's not about acquiring things. It's about becoming the best and grandest and greatest version of yourself. Does anyone relate? So let's do this. If I say something and you agree, and you feel that you, know, you agree at an inner level, just snap your fingers. We're not going to be talking about science here. We're going to be talking about philosophy. The funny thing about philosophy is I can't back this up with data or evidence, but I can, but we can understand how true it feels by listening to the snapping sound of people who agree. Do you agree? Awesome. One more thing that happened, ease. It almost seemed as if life became magical. There were magical moments and coincidences and synchronicities. In short, I was in flow. And all of these changes happened when I started living from these four values and made them the core of who I was. And all of that shit that was happening from 2013 to 2016 disappeared. I no longer had to be a cockroach. So I want to share the four values and how to implement them in your life. Now, you don't have to take all four. You could take one or two or three. You might develop your own value. But the important here is, the philosophical understanding, and then the application. If you don't apply, then the understanding is nothing more that, than fuzz at the back of your mind. Now, the first value actually came from Rao himself. Rao was speaking at Mind Valley live in Los Angeles, and after he got off stage, he came and approached me and he said, Vision, we gotta take these ideas bigger. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I teach at the best MBA schools in America, and I can tell you that they are teaching the wrong thing. So I'm like, do tell. He says, they teach you that your life is about your career and your money, and that's wrong. So I'm like, um, what should they teach? And he goes, what they should teach is this. I now call this rule number one. And it says, your work is not about your work. Rather, your work is nothing more than the greatest vehicle for your personal evolution. He said, personal growth, perpetual growth should be your ultimate identity. And you must put your personal growth before everything else. Now, this part may get a little bit controversial. Before your work, before the title of CEO, before your billion-dollar company, before your marriage, and before your children. If you agree, feel free to snap. If you don't agree, don't do anything. I'm not saying you have to agree. Like I said, these are just philosophies, right? I'm simply stating what Rao said. He says, if you make personal growth first, everything else grows. So it doesn't make you selfish, but everything else grows. But what happens is you escape from the rules that tell you how to be and what to do. And that is when you're truly operating from your soul. So this becomes rule one. In fact, what Rao said is that if your business fails, it doesn't matter. Did you grow? If your business succeeds, it doesn't matter. Did you grow? And I found that really liberating because I was feeling like a failure for failing consistently. But when Rao changed my mental model, and he, he uses the word mental model, I started seeing failure as simply a means to growth. So when you see failure as a means to growth, you become immune to failure. And that is the real beauty here. So 
Rao's rule is also best illustrated in this, this, this really cool quote I, had, I saw a friend share on Instagram, and it says this, grow so fast your old friends have to get to know you all over again. So I want to introduce you to a term, right? I call it ROSE, rate of self-evolution. Your rate of self-evolution. Your rate of self-evolution or your ROSE must be the ultimate thing in your life. In other words, your life needs to be about personal growth. Many of us forget that. We make our life about our children. That's wrong. If you look at the concept of conscious parenting, which Shafali Sabari teaches, your children are nothing more than the vehicle for your greatest evolution. She, Shafali, who has been on Oprah seven times, says, you are not there to teach your children. Your children are souls to teach you. Likewise, your work and your business is not there for the title or the money. No, those are bullshit constructs from the culture scape. You will get that if you make your business about making you grow. So personal growth becomes everything. Now, I want to introduce another idea, which I really like. This comes from the book, Atomic Habits. So in the book, the author says that we often approach personal growth wrong. We want to lose weight. So we say, it's going to be about the process. I am going to do this particular exercise. Or it becomes about the outcome. I am going to go from 30% body fat to 20% body fat. And the book says that's actually wrong. Don't think about outcome. Don't think about process. You really want to shift shift identity. Think, I am born with this incredible body, which is going to stay young and athletic forever. Or I am a Spartan, or I am always healthy, fit, and muscular. When you make it about the identity, you get the outcome, and the process becomes effortless. You don't have to use willpower. So one of the first things we did at Mind Valley was we started changing the identity of everyone in our team. That's actually a picture of Mind Valley people at the gym in the morning, everyone in that picture works at Mind Valley, cheering each other on like um, people are going through a fitness test over here. And the cool thing about when you shift your identity, you've heard the phrase, right? You were the sum of the five people closest to you. Everyone around you, you infect their identity as well. It's one of the reasons why, you know, this tribe is so powerful. When you get on WildFit or when you get into shape, it ripples. Jason Campbell, Jason, could you run on stage, please? And do you mind taking off your shirt as you do so? No, okay, you don't have to, but Jason, come on stage just for kicks, just for kicks. Jason, so, no, I'm serious. Would you mind taking off your shirt? What? No? Your, your golf? What? Okay. So, so the reason, the reason it, it was a legit question. So Jason was a chubby Canadian guy. Like, I remember, I literally remember a conversation with him. He had come back from December, back with his parents in Canada. He's like, Vision, they fed me so much cheese. And, and Jason was interviewing a tribe member, right? Um, who was the tribe member you were interviewing? I don't know about the tribe member, but I, you just remind me of a memory when I came back at Team Retreat. And the first thing you said after not seeing me for a few weeks, you were like, Jason, you look so big. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Vision. <laughs> So, uh, so, so you were interviewing uh, Jimmy. You were interviewing a tribe member, Jimmy. So Jimmy is a uh, Jimmy Narain. You guys know Jimmy, right? Okay, so Jimmy Narain's an A-fester. He's been to multiple A-fest. Jason was interviewing Jimmy, and Jimmy is really fit. And Jason said, how do you do that? And Jimmy says, well, I have this identity that I am a Spartan. And that struck something in Jason's mind. The very next day, within 24 hours, Jason implemented that identity. He signed up for Spartan Race. He ran his first Spartan Race and took four people from Mind Valley with him. It was in the middle of a typhoon in the Philippines. And um, 5,000 people ran in the middle of a typhoon. Now, that was so exciting. The next Spartan Race, 27 people ran. And the next Spartan Race, 40 people ran. And today, when you join Mind Valley, if you are a guy, we don't measure this for women, but only men, you lose 10 kilograms in your first year. And typically by year two, you're running a Spartan race. So we have more like abs, <laughs> visible abs for male than probably any other company out there. So all I'll say is have, we're all going to be wearing costumes tonight. So you might have a chance <laughs> to see the abs then. Right. So, but Jason, but my point is Jason infected an entire culture with that attitude. So every morning people are working out together. People are training for the Spartan race. And that's what identity shift does. Okay, so thank you, Jason. Thank you. Although I'm so disappointed you kept your damn shirt on. So the toolkit is identity shift. How do you, how do you engineer identity shifts? I learned this really powerful technique from Christy Marie Sheldon. She's one of our Mind Valley teachers. Now, she calls it lofty questions. So first, you decide the areas of your life that you want to create anew. And now, in the morning, during your meditation, you do not say an affirmation. 
you raise a question to your subconscious. You see, affirmations don't work. Jose Silva, the great mind science pioneer, established that in the 1980s. If you say, if, if you are not in a healthy state and you say, why am I so ripped and muscular? In the back of your mind, there's gonna be a little voice that says, no, you aren't ripped and muscular, you liar. You ate that pizza last night. <laughs> and if you're going, what voice? I don't have that voice. That's the voice. So, <laughs> you guys got that? So lofty questions are different. You trick your subconscious. You don't give a statement that your subconscious is gonna inevitably make you deny. You actually create a statement like that. Why do I wake up every day feeling connected to Sauce? Why am I such a powerful learner? Why am I running a hundred million dollar company? Why do I have such a loving and exciting relationship? Why do I have the fit muscular body of an athlete? These are all lofty statements that I do right now. The beautiful thing about lofty statements, and you can, you can design your own. The beautiful thing about lofty statements is your mind cannot deny them. Rather, you are posing a question to your subconscious. And if you are in the right state of flow, I believe that it activates your subconscious to find you the answers. So let's look at that last one, right? Why do I have the fit muscular body of an athlete? I started saying that in January 2016. January 2016, and I was not fit. I mean, I was, I was okay, right? But you know, I, I was at maybe 22% body fat. I met Eric Edmeads two weeks later. Is Eric in the room? There he is. I met Eric Edmeads two weeks later. He was, he was teaching people the wild fit diet. I got on wild fit. 90 days later, I'd gone down to 14% body fat. It was amazing how fast it worked. I tried to lose weight for 10 years. I couldn't. I tried to have a disciplined gym practice for 10 years. I couldn't. Within weeks of stating this, using this statement, my body shifted. I was disciplined. I was only attracted to good food. And then weird synchronicities like meeting Eric came into my life. I got on WildFit. Now, it didn't stop. Six months after WildFit, I'd lost weight, but I wasn't still athletic. I bumped into a guy who works at Mind Valley, and it turns out he's like a workout genius, Lorenzo. He developed the 10X protocol, and now he starts training me. And then, you know, from that, the ripples start happening. A hundred people from my team went into uh, WildFit and then into 10X. And now that statement for me is true. Now I, stay, I state it to maintain it. So it's crazy how when you shift your identity, at a subconscious level, the world shifts. But remember what Michael Beckwith said, the law of attraction is incomplete. It's really the law of resonance. When you change who you are, the world will shift to make, to ensure that who you are is true. So it starts inside. Don't think attraction, think resonance. So that was value number one. But you get there when you embrace personal growth as the number one thing. So I want to encourage you to try the Lofty Questions exercise. If you want to go deeper, get on Google, just search for Lofty Questions, Mind Valley. You'll find a free five-minute video on it. Now, the second thing is envisioning. Being dedicated to your personal growth is amazing. But how many people do we know who have great bodies or who spend so much time meditating, but they are broke? They're not contributing to the world. Especially true with many spiritual people. I believe the point of spirituality is not just to go within, it's to go into introspection so we can emerge and actually shake up the world. I call it the unification of the Buddha and the badass. You want to merge both. The world doesn't need more Buddhas. The world needs Buddhas who are badasses. Ken Wilber in his famous essay, Egolessness, said, the great spiritual saints and sages of the world, from Moses to Padmasambhava to Jesus, were not feeble-minded milquetoes. They were movers and shakers, from bullwhips in the temple to subduing entire continents. They rattled the world with the force of their ego. So, as you embrace personal growth, it doesn't remove you from the world. If you do, that is not personal growth. That's probably a cult. <laughs> you want to embrace personal growth, where you worship the Buddha, you go within but you use the insight, the satori moments, the intuition from that to get out there and fucking shake up the world. Agree? So this gives us rule number two, dream big. And when you dream big, the problems become small. Too many people in the world are worried about stupid small shit, the guy who didn't text them back, for example. But when you dream big, what happens is the little stuff doesn't matter because you have something far, far, far greater Michael Beckwith said, this is the difference between needing motivation, needing to be pushed towards a vision, or having a vision for your life that's so big that it pulls you. He says, when you get it right, motivation is bunk. You do not need to attend motivational seminars. 
because you are pulled by a vision. You do not need to be pushed to get there. Agreed? So, when you dream big, your problems become small, which is why what I try to do in my life is always try to dream bigger and bigger and bigger. So after AFES became successful, we decided to try Mind Valley University, for example. You gotta keep your mind focused on bigger and bigger things. So you gotta be happy and grateful, all of that is great, but you gotta keep envisioning a better vision for yourself. So here's the toolkit. Now, interestingly enough, the toolkit to being able to take on bold goals starts with having small goals. Elon Musk gave a really famous interview to Neil deGrasse Tyson, the famous physicist, and Neil asked Elon, how do you have the cojones to go out there and start Tesla and SpaceX and PayPal and tackle all of these big things? And Elon Musk said, when I was a college kid in America, I decided to do an experiment. I decided to see if I could live on $1 a day. And he found out he could. He could go to Walmart, buy ramen noodles for like 50 cents a package in bulk and live on a dollar a day. He was living in a student dorm, so he didn't have to pay rent. And he said, that gave me the sense of safety that I could do bigger things. When I knew my survival was guaranteed, I was able to think really big. So many of us have irrational fears that come from our evolution as pre-humans and the savannas. But when we understand that the world is ultimately safe, we give ourselves liberty to do big things. So the technique here, and this is what I implemented, is something called self-fueled goals. So you have big goals, yes, but as a baseline, you have goals so simple that you can activate them instantly. The definition of a self fuel goal is this. If everyone you knew in your life abandoned you and you had no one and you were homeless in the streets of New York with no money, could you still hit these goals? Let's look at them. Why am I always surrounded by love? Notice these goals are worded as lofty questions. When you truly understand love, you find that love comes from within. The ultimate love is love of yourself. Agree? Now, you can be homeless. You can have no one around you. But if you know that you can activate love within, that goal is activated. The second thing is, why am I always learning and growing? Learning is free these days. You can be homeless in the streets of New York. You can still go to the public library and check out a book. It's free. Now, the third one is, why? Is the universe always unfolding for me in the most amazing way? If you're homeless in the streets of New York, take a walk down Central Park. You can still do that, it's free, and you will be gifted with the most amazing nature and scenery you can imagine. That is the universe unfolding for you. So when you understand, when I started to understand that I could be homeless on the streets of New York, all neediness disappeared, all fears disappeared. The idea that I might lose my company disappeared. It just didn't matter anymore because I knew I was safe on planet Earth. And so the trick to big goals starts with the little goals. And when you know that the little things, the self fuel goals are there, you can think big. But that's just step one. So in my three most important questions under experiences, growth, and contribution, they are little goals, but they are also big goals. But the little goals, they are the foundation. You've got to have both. Too many people forget these little goals. Write them down. Think about what are the little things you want in life. Maybe it's to always love yourself. Maybe it's to always feel connected to source. Maybe it's to always appreciate your body. You can start on these immediately. But now you need what I call the bowl goals. Now for the bowl goals, what we implemented in Mind Valley was actually a secret we learned from Google. And it's called the Google goals technique. Larry Page invented this. Really simple. This is a great thing to do in your business. 50% of your goal should have a 50% chance of failure. So literally, it means if you're using OKRs, if you have four or five goals for the year, one to two of your goals should have a 50% chance of failure. If you have 10, if you have, say, eight goals, four of them or two should have a 50% chance of failure. That means it's a coin flip. Now, when you do this, two things happen. Number one, you truly dream big. And number two, when failure happens, it's okay. That was the whole point. So, in Google's culture, 40% of all their corporate goals they fail at. Their failure rate is 40%. Google failed on Google Buzz, Google failed on um, Google+, Plus, but it also gave the world YouTube and Gmail and the Android phone. But by making it a stated goal to have goals that have a 50% chance of failure, you unlock yourself to really dream big and to have moonshots. So this became a really important rule. So at Mind Valley, every, every, de every department has that, the company has that, and soon every individual is going to have that. Okay, so that is idea number two. Now the third one, really simple, unity. So again, 
You can be a creator. You can be incredibly self-transformed. But unity is the one that ensures that you are a healthy self for the human race. And you're not manipulating or cheating or taking advantage of other people, right? You're doing it for the good of the world. This brings us to rule number three. Your life is not about you. Rather, your life is about the lives of everyone you touch. Now, this rule came in a really interesting way. We were at Mind Valley University in Barcelona. Neil Donald Walsh, who wrote Conversations with God, had come down. Because what many people don't know is that Mind Valley University was inspired partially by the future societies that Neil wrote about in his Conversations with God books. So I brought him down to teach the class. There were about 300 of you in a room. And one of you, she may even be in this room, raised her hand and said, Neil, what do I do? in those situations when I wake up in the morning and I feel sad or depressed or unworthy. And Neil said, remember, your life is not about you. Rather, your life is about the lives of everyone you touch. When you remember this and when you make your life about service, you will never wake up feeling depressed or lonely or afraid or worried again. He went on to say, when you walk in a room, set an intention to heal the room, even if you're one out of 400 people coming in, make your life about service. So the whole crowd was really, really, really like taken in by this idea and really resonated with it. If you do, give us a snap. So how do you do that? Well, you've got to identify what is called your North Star. Your North Star is that part of you that you want to use to serve the world. Elon Musk, really simple, his North Star is colonizing Mars. And the fact is, you don't have to know how to get to your North Star. I um, got to have an audience with Elon Musk once. And I remember he told our group when we asked him, so, you know, what, what's the big picture? This was like 2015, before, you know, he was as famous as he is today. And he says, I want to colonize Mars. And he also said this. He said, it's probably going to happen in around 10 years. I, have, I don't know yet how to get there. I'm thinking around 10 years. I sometimes miss my deadlines. He was really humble about it. But when you think about how Elon Musk talks, he doesn't talk about how he runs a rocket company. He talks about how he's going to colonize Mars. And that's what excites his employees. Do you know SpaceX is the number one company great engineers want to join? But there are 19 other companies that do the same thing. Jeff Bezos has Blue Horizons. But why SpaceX gets all the attention, even though all SpaceX is, is a vertical trucking company. Regular trucking company moves goods th this way. SpaceX moves goods this way. Vertical trucking. But it's the most desirable company to join for the world's greatest engineers because Musk doesn't talk about vertical trucking. He talks about colonizing that red planet. You see, the secret here is to always have a frame of reference where you imagine your life 10 years ahead for your business, for your craft. So I started something really interesting. When people would ask me, what did Mind Valley do? I actually would not talk about what we were doing now. I would talk about what we were doing in the future. If you look at our website from 2016, when I started embracing this, and you can go back on archive.org, you will see I spoke about starting a university. I spoke about going into health. All of that happened. Wildfit, Mind Valley University. I spoke about what wanted to happen 10 years in the future. What's funny about this is when you speak about the future as if it's now, people want to follow you. Customers want to buy from you. People want to be part of this future. And it's okay if you fail, because remember, 50% of your goals are supposed to have a 50% chance of failure anyway. And I state that. I'm like, all right, this is the future I'm going to build, but um, halfway it's not going to happen. Do you want in? And people want in. So this is one of the most amazing things. It is the power of speaking about your life and what you're doing 10 years into the future. Try it tonight. When somebody asks you, you know, that awkward question, what do you do? Pretend. So now, how do, you, how do you embrace this future thinking, and how do you bring this into your company? Now, there is a trick to it, right? The future that you want to build has to be a future that supports unity. Elon Musk doesn't want to colonize Mars so he can be the first man on Mars. He wants to colonize Mars so he can back up the human race and make us an interplanetary species that is thinking about the other 8 billion cells that make up the human colossus. That's how you want to talk about the future. Now, maybe you run a company that is not working on something that bold and ambitious. Sri Kumar Rao once told me about a story where he was teaching a class, and the CEO in the class ran a company that manufactured window glass. And the CEO said, 
Sri Kumar, how do I speak about 10 years in the future? All I do is provide a commodity that's glass. And Rao said, but isn't it true that for one week every year in your community where you employ 200 people, you take all your employees and you allow them to go and work for non-profits like an orphanage or a soup kitchen and you pay their salaries for a week? That is how you contribute. You're helping contribute to a more compassionate world. So speak about that. You, he told the CEO, are taking a stand for service. Speak about that. It doesn't matter that you manufacture glass. If people know that that is the core and the soul of your company, they will want to join you and you will inspire people. So Rao, in other, in other words, said, don't try to be inspirational. Instead, be inspired. This CEO wasn't inspirational, but he was inspired by the people who worked in soup kitchens, by the people who clothed the homeless, and he wanted to give his employees that experience. So how do you do it? The toolkit is take a stand. Like Martin Luther King spoke a lot about this. He said, power without love is reckless and abusive. Love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. So you take a stand. For example, when uh, me and Eric um, did a wildfit campaign last year, we took a stand against Nestle. It became the biggest news story in Malaysia. And what we wanted to do was expose how Nestle was getting kids addicted to sugary drinks and, and putting it up as energy drinks. And it was huge. It became the biggest story in the country for seven days. And Nestle lost their health ratings for their Milo, which is a crappy product in Australia, New Zealand, and they introduced zero sugar Milo in Singapore partially because we took a stand against this $80 billion company. Another thing I wanted to share, and Marsha Weider, who's in the audience, asked me to share this video today because she said it really touched her. When Mind Valley was going through this shift in 2016, right, when Trump won the election, we felt that while we hope he does well, there were certain things he said that were very much against our value of unity. We are a country that employs people from 54 countries. Ola Abbas, who runs our big events in the US, happens to be from Sudan a country whose nationals Trump wanted to completely ban from entering the US. So I'm like, no way Trump is gonna affect you know, my, my Sudanese friend here. We need to speak out. So my team and I created this video. Now remember, back then we weren't as big as we were, but we took a stand. And it's very important that if you absorb the value of unity, you act on it and you stand up for what really matters. So this is the video that we created. the wall. I stand for love. I stand for peace. I stand for unity. Education. The environment. Equality. I stand for refugees. In an age of dangerous politics, don't let bullies force you to sit down. To tell you, you're being too political or unpatriotic. When you speak your truth. To tell you, you can't stand tall. Or that you don't belong here. Speak up, rise up. Unite. And to those who dare to stand, Our team is really proud of that video. And, and the funny thing is, when we did that, people are like, why would you release this? You'll just turn off you know, some of your customers. Um, but actually, what happened is when we released this video, within six months, like, it was insane how much Mindvalley grew. Because people realized that we weren't just 
in it for the buck that we actually wanted to make a change in the world. And we still embody a lot of these values. For example, like I'm really big on refugees. So at Mind Valley University, I'm sponsoring true Syrian refugee teenagers to come uh, and attend the classes because I want our children who are going to be at Mind Valley University to understand what a Syrian refugee went through. I think that's one of the most incredible things to learn from and hopefully befriend a refugee and open up their minds to the plight of a hundred million displaced people in the world. Regular education doesn't teach you that. So the stand is something that's so important, but all of it comes from the value of unity, of ensuring that your compassion, your love, extends outside just the borders of your nation or your gender or your industry to all people, everywhere. And that brings us to the fourth value, which is love. So Khalil Gibran said, all work is empty, save when there is love. And when you work with love, you bind yourself to yourself and to one another and to God. So that's really what this one is about. And this one too became a, a value that I wanted to anchor in with a rule. And the rule is, we do our best work when we care for each other and we are cared for. So this became one of the underlying values of Mind Valley. It can also be a really good value for this particular tribe. Now this value is actually really powerful. Just a few months ago, Stanford released one of its top programs to the world. And 95% of Stanford MBAs have taken this course, and they started offering the course online free for the first time. Now, what's really interesting is um, the course is $5,500. You can take you know, a week-long one for $16,000. It's expensive, but you know what the course is about? Stanford graduates actually refer to this as the touchy-feely course. That's the nickname that they call it. And it's really about understanding that true unicorn employees are those that have two strong, seemingly unrelated skills, one left brain, logic, analytic reasoning, and one right brain, intuition and creativity. But the intuition and creativity are fueled when we are kind and compassionate to each other. In other words, in the workplace, if you want to succeed, you basically compete on one thing, and that is kindness. And so what we try to do is, is, to, is to figure out how can we make love part of everything we do. Um, I love seeing comments like this about Mind Valley. I went from, I only care about myself and my family, the rest can go and figure it out on their own, to I love all humans and entities in the universe, and I have a responsibility to protect them. So that is the value that we try to put into everything we do. If you agree, snap. So toolkits, really interesting new ideas, right? Now, the first idea is the concept of rules versus feelings. So. I've always found that no one I ever met could really tell me the true difference between masculine leadership and feminine leadership. We hear these words tossed around. I've looked at many different leadership people talk about it. No one I felt could really explain it until I met this man, Ken Wilber. So Ken Wilber wrote a book called Integral Vision, and in that book, he cites a feminist philosopher by the name of Carol Gilligan. And when, I, when Ken explained this to me, it changed a lot of things. Carol Gilligan said that even if males take on the ideas of unity and love, or masculine rather, they express it in a way which is rule dominant. So even if you look at Martin Luther King, who is very world-centric, very loving, it's about justice, it's about rights, it's about rules first. But he says that with women, or Carol Gilligan says that with women, with the feminine, it's about feelings first, feelings beyond the rules. With male, it's rules beyond the feelings. So for example, Carol Gilligan says that if you look at a group of boys playing baseball and one guy strikes out and he has to go on the bench, he goes on the bench. But let's say that boy was crying. The other guys are like, oh, come on, you strike out, just soak it up, like be a man. But woman would say, he's crying. There are tears streaming down his face. Forget the rules, just give him another chance at bat. So masculine and feminine operate in a different way. Now this is reflected in the company as well. So what it means is that you care for rules and feelings. Recently, about a year ago, we had a person who was fired from our company. And um, you know, we followed the rules, HR followed the rules, she was not performing well. Um, the manager didn't want to rehire her, she had gone on extended leave and she hadn't checked in as much. And so she was let go, following the rules, straight up termination. However, the other part of the story is, she was gone on extended leave because her mother had died, and she wanted to be by her mom on her deathbed. But what HR did was operate completely from the masculine perspective. I'm sorry, but the performance isn't there. 
we need this job filled, we can't give you your, your role back. Now, the feminine leadership, as for Carol Gilligan, would be different. So this person ended up writing to me and saying, Vision, I think Mind Valley has no values because how the hell could you treat me like this? And I agreed with her. What had happened through HR was wrong. And so we decided that we still follow the rules. We couldn't let her, you know, we couldn't give her the job because her manager didn't want her. But we had to take into account the feelings she was going through. So we decided to give her the biggest severance package we'd ever given anyone. We gave her five months full salary so she could get back on her feet recover, heal, start a new business, or get a new job. And as soon as we did that, the masculine side of HR came up again and said, but you can't do that because now everyone is gonna ask for five months severance. But both sides came together and we said, okay, we're gonna establish a simple bylaw that says we will care for people and create a compassionate leave policy. If someone is going through a lot of struggle, a lot of pain, no worries, we will ensure that we give them five months severance. So you see, you can merge both. And when you merge both, this is when you really create like the healthy dynamic. Does everyone get that? Yeah. So we started merging both. When we bring our teachers or our speakers into AFES, we care about how they feel. We care about how they feel when they walk up. We care about their experience at the costume parties on the final day. Like tonight, I'm actually body painting several of our speakers. <laughs> because we don't want them to just come. Um, um, no, that's not just like a weird kink I have. We don't want to just come, like, get on the stage and leave. We want to make sure that they truly feel part of this tribe. And you can do this in many different ways. You can infuse love into the workplace. Many of you have seen how Mind Valley incorporates Love Week. There's a really great video on this online. If you get a chance, check it out. It's just called Love Week Mind Valley. It's one week during Valentine's Day when everyone in the company just, like, appreciates each other. Okay, so those are the four things. Now, those are the four values that completely shifted it for me. So what happened is I stopped thinking, okay, CEOs do this. I stopped getting obsessed with the p and I simply decided to, to be the values, to be transformation, to be envisioning, to be unity, to be love. And when that happens, what's going on is that you're truly listening to your soul. You're truly listening to what your soul wants. And everything else starts falling into place. You move from Kensho or grow through pain to Satori or grow to insight. Now, now, you can absorb any of those four values you want. My values are pretty generic, but do you have unique values to yourself? I bet you do. And the clue lies in your wounding. Rumi was insightful in many ways, but another great Rumi quote is this, the wound is the place where the light enters. And what this means is that when you get wounded, light will go through that wound. And this light might be your best, your most incredible gift of insight. Remember Adam Rowa took the stage this morning and spoke about being molested at the age of five. And Adam has gone on to become the love poet because he had to find all the ways he could to forgive and love back the man who cruelly violated him. And today his YouTube channel is all about truly understanding love. His wound was the place where the light enters. Think back to a moment where you went through deep pain and you'll find your values came from pain. The most compassionate people who want to inject compassion in their workplaces were acted cruelly upon. The people who were abused are the people who stand for the opposite of abuse, for love and forgiveness. Your values come from your pain. And that is one of the great secrets of life. Your pain is often not your pain. Your suffering doesn't have to be suffering. Viktor Frankl said, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds its meaning. And so the great exercise that I want you guys to do as you go home after this A-Fest is to actually think back on the times that you went through that big Kensho moment. It may be something painful, but what was your soul trying to gift you in terms of meaning? And when that meaning comes, it ceases to become suffering. It just becomes an incident in your life that sparked the greatness in you. So now, when we go back to this poem, think about what it means. When I run, when I run after what I think I want, my days are a furnace of distress and anxiety. Don't follow the status quo. As Beckwith said, you are not here to fill the status quo. You're here to take a hammer to it and smash it. But if you sit in your own place of patience, what you need flows to you without any pain. You're listening within. 
From this you understand that what you want also wants you, is looking for you and attracting you. And there's a great secret in this for anyone who can grasp it. So the exercise looks like this. This was the actual sheet of paper that Amir Ahmad took me through when I did this values exercise. And I want to explain what's going on over here. So we're going to break it down because you should, when you get a chance, do this as well. It'll take you around two to three hours, but I promise you it's one of the greatest things you can do. So first, the first question is, Amir told me to write down what are the things that I offer to the world. So back then in 2016, we offered courses, events, we offered challenges or quests, and we offered community, as in the AFES tribe. Then he said, what are the values or beliefs that most resonate with you? Like, what are words that you hear in a song that make you make your heart skip a beat? What are ideas that inspire you? What's the poetry or the mo movies that enlighten you? And I, I made this long list. Okay, transformation, connectedness, compassion, growth as a goal, humanism, aesthetics, vision, happiness. It took me around one to two hours to really make this list. And then you go through every item in the list and you add a number to it to cluster it. So all the ones, you see transformation, growth as a goal, transcendence, all relate to transformation. You give it one word. It's all really the same thing. All the number twos, compassion, connectedness, humanism, um, are all related to unity. So I gave it the word um, unity or connectedness. All the number threes, aesthetics, vision, all relate to like this one, vision. And then you'll notice that there are, there's a couple of others, futurism, questioning, all of these like rely, those, those were too, too little, so you discarded them. You wanna arrive at around three or four. Now my number four was happiness, love, that became the value of love. So initially I wrote down connectedness, transformation, vision. Amir to told me to start with three. Later on I added love. But these evolved, connectedness became unity, transformation became transformation, growth as a goal, vision became envisioning, and love became the fourth value. So that's really where it came from. This piece of paper changed my life. This piece of paper caught me to unplug from the rules of the modern world, to really listen to my soul, to understand what is it that made me come to earth and to truly listen within. And when I did that, everything in Mind Valley shifted. It, it was, and the shift was so remarkable, like it almost sounds magical. I went from three years of pain and suffering and feeling like the universe was like against me to three years of the most incredible growth where I wake up every day going, holy shit, my life is magical. But everyone has access to this. But to get there, you gotta go really deep within. The answer is all within. And so I wanna encourage you to do this exercise um, to, to really embody this and to bring it back into your life. And as you go forth to try to scale your influence, remember, don't fall prey to the rules of the modern world. Everything you need to know, the insight, comes from sitting in your space of patience and going within. And that was really the lesson I wanted to share. Thank you all.